Rise and Shine. Welcome back to Rise and Shine. And if I tell you about science, it's a, it's, a, it's a subject that you can talk vastly for years and years. And it includes astronomy, physics, and also archaeology also on the sides. We have a doctor today to speak about all three converged about astrophysics and also astroarchaeology. Please welcome Dr. Uh, Kavan Ratnatunga, astrophysicist, uh, joining with us today. And she, he's also... Good morning. Uh, good morning to you. And uh, he's actually... Uh, I'm working on a number of projects that also held a number of positions around the world and also has earned a number of qualifications, including PhDs as well. And we'd like to welcome you, Doctor, uh, once again uh, on the show. It's great to have Good you morning. because you are a family, of play, a family of face on the <laughs> Unruf Money Corporation on the Atta River program. And uh, today uh, we're going to talk about um, throughout everything that you have done throughout your life. Okay. Uh, to begin with, we'll speak about the uh, Apollo mission and how you actually um, you know, contributed towards that. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't say that I contributed to the Apollo mission. <laughs> that was when I was in, still in school. <laughs> okay. But I can remember I was inspired to do astronomy mm -hmm. as a field, which was not a popular uh, sort of something that you did. Yeah. My mother was thinking that I would ask nuts to do something, <laughs> a hobby into a career. But uh, basically, Arthur Clark used to go to the, all the Apollo missions, and mm -hmm. he was like the compare with Walter Conkright mm -hmm. and at those in those missions he basically came back and we didn't have TV at the time mm -hmm. so all we could have was to, for him to come back mm -hmm. USIS used to bring films down mm -hmm. uh, which were shown at the Lincoln Auditorium and that was the time that we could actually see what happened in the US mm -hmm. now it is instant uh, t uh, TV, uh, TV instant. but uh, back in the 1960s uh, we didn't have any TV at all <laughs> So, it is completely different era now. Okay. And that was actually, and I can remember going for a radio show with Arthur Clark, mm -hmm. uh, question and answer as a school boy. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the one that was Published featured the in the Sunday Times mm -hmm. uh, article. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, I got inspired to do astronomy. So, I did a uh, physics special course in the Columbia University mm -hmm. and went off to uh, become an astrophysicist. There are quite a few Sri Lankan astrophysicists around the world, not mm -hmm. many, mm -hmm. maybe about 15 or 20, uh, who have remained in the field and doing research. Okay. So I'm the only one actually who has come back now to Sri Lanka. Come back to Sri Lanka. And I came back in 2005. I have mm -hmm. been here since. And You've uh, been working on astro something completely different now. Yes. And after I came back, I have been involved more with archaeology than uh, astronomy mm -hmm. and uh, that's also I brought out some interesting results. That's brilliant. Doctor also now we uh, like there's a lot of information that you can discuss about you all the contributions that you have done towards science and archaeology and physics in particular. Um, could you also speak about the Hubble project and how you have your involvement was with Yeah, that? I was I went to the states um, for the to join the Hubble project in 1992. Mm -hmm. And I was with the Hubble project all the way up to uh, 2004. Mm -hmm. And the Hubble basically is one of the most successful uh, projects. It was launched in 1990. So we are almost coming up to 30 years of the Hubble. I don't think anybody envisaged that the Hubble would be lasting for 30 years. Uh, we start initially there was a lot of hiccups uh, where uh, there was... Uh, uh, a default fault in the primary mirror, mm -hmm. and that was repaired. Okay. And then back in, can I have this? Yes, in, okay. uh, if you can explain what's on the screen. Yeah. As well. So then in uh, 1995, mm -hmm. we were lucky to, as you would see on the screen, we were lucky to discover the first gravitational lens with the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay. And that was quite a first. We were quite unexpectedly, we knew that those lenses would be there, but we didn't expect to be the first to discover one with the Hubble. Doctor, could you explain what that does um, okay. to the obvious? A gravitational lens is a distant quasar or something. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, even Einstein basically said that when light goes close to a 
large object mm -hmm. and it could the large object could be the sun it could be the uh, galaxy or whatever mm -hmm. that it bends uh, slightly okay so this was originally predicted back by uh, einstein in 1990 and with the general theory of relati relativity mm -hmm. and it was tested actually in an eclipse in 1919 to show that the starlight close to the sun was bent at the time of the eclipse so that light comes but it was actually its first gravitational lenses were only discovered back in 1979. Mm -hmm. And with the Hubble, those are very rare to mm -hmm. find them from the Earth. They were mostly discovered with radio, mm -hmm. where you found quasars, double quasars, which had the same light and we knew it was the same object that okay. you are seeing twice. Uh -huh. And with respect to the light, uh, light gravitational lenses, which were discovered also around that time after observing the radio. Mm -hmm. uh, the Hubble, uh, in, with the observations, we found this particular uh, gravitational lens which has four objects. Uh, mm -hmm. You would see it at the top of that web page oh. that was shown before. Not if you could. Yeah. And uh, it's a bit difficult. Ah, yeah, that's one. It's if you focus on th this object, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think you might see the four faint uh, uh, stars around stars it, around it mm -hmm. uh, you would see it on the point in, in on that uh, web page. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did not know what it was initially, but then we studied it and we… Uh, I think those are the pictures. That, oh yeah, the top the one. The first one, okay. And the, I was just involved with what was called the medium deep survey. Mm -hmm. Now, the medium deep survey, the Hubble time is very expensive. I mean, mm -hmm. it's each, there is about 15 orbits uh, for the day, for uh, one and a half hour orbits for the day. Mm -hmm. And for that, you, you observe for about half the time because oh. other half of the time the, you are in sunlight. Okay. Uh, and those orbits, you know, if you cost, take the cost of Hubble and the annual budget, which was around $300 million, wow. uh, was uh, like a million dollars a day. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so each orbit you could say was worth $100,000. So you had to do things. So when you, we use, people used to, observe this to get you know a few hours of uh, observing maybe for a year mm -hmm. but we had a parallel program okay hubble had many instruments okay and when one instrument was watching uh, the st some doing some observation the parallel instruments particularly if it was imaging instrument was doing nothing so we proposed that during that time that instrument was doing nothing and seeing a patch of random sky close mm -hmm. by that mm -hmm. we would take photographs of whatever that patch of sky mm -hmm. was and then analyze that. Okay. So others used may get 10 hours of observing for a year, we used to get hundreds. Hundreds, okay. Uh, and I went there actually to automate, you know, right. few hours you can do it manually, but when you so have hundreds this is after you take the photograph and you analyze the photograph? Is yes, it? to okay. analyze, find the, now, beca particularly because we were watching, looking at random directions. Okay. Uh, the, in, during in the random directions, you don't know what you get, right? Yeah. So you had to have uh, automated image analysis to actually discover what galaxies you found there. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote some automated software, which was the drive the thing that actually analyzed it. Okay. And most of the others couldn't afford to write the sof sophisticated automated analysis. So then there was uh, data which was actually. Uh, public domain mm -hmm. after one year mm -hmm. and you did I we expected to not to find anything there because uh, the astronomers had it for a whole year and we got it only after that. after that but I analyzed that data through the automated system and we were lucky to find the first gravitational lens on public data <laughs> Wow. Well, that's definitely and that was incredible because incredible. I didn't know at the time whether the others already knew about it. Okay. So we rushed into print and got a f the first paper that published. was published on the subject, and therefore. Was the grant of all? No, 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 no. Oh. Uh, they get me that uh, there is a paper, uh, the, uh, the article, article. Yeah. This one, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so and the f that's 1995, uh, and then. Uh, then uh, about a few years later, this article um, on the first Einstein lens. Mm -hmm. And uh, then afterwards, in uh, ten years, uh, five years later, we published a whole collection of possible gravitational lenses, wow. which is the list that you actually saw on that web page. So this is the same light 
duplicated. Yeah. So the basically what happens is that uh, the light comes in and gets folded in. Okay. And in it's, it's like mirages, basically oh, right, the same right. concept of a mirage. When you see something which is reflected by um, uh, sort of reflect reflected uh, sort of from uh, the light bended bending by uh, changes in the atmospheric density. Here you basically get light bending and you find four objects around it which are actually the same object. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to do a lot of research because okay. that light came on different paths and you can do a lot of research on and the whole universe with those. So there's been quite a few gravitational lenses found and mm -hmm. this quad lens was the first one. Then we found a second one also soon after mm -hmm. on the same data. All right. So Doctor, now um, from uh, this particular project, we would also like to uh, Diver diversify a bit into you know the archaeology side of it, right. which you also. You so know, I came. Started. I got interested uh, back in '98. I got interested in. I mean, we were on all on the web, mm -hmm. and I discovered that there was not much data on Sri Lanka on the web, mm -hmm. and that was sort of thing we had to publicize our um, uh, country. So I started a website called Lakdiva.org. That's the website we are showing. That. Yeah. And I were had a particular. Uh, I suddenly discovered in the U.S. Give me the gold coin. That I found a gold coin uh, mm -hmm. being sold at uh, in a sh in a big coin show. Okay. And I didn't believe that I could buy eighth century gold gold coins in the U.S. That's right. And uh, I sort of was quite surprised. And that's a coin. This is a eighth century gold coin, Kahavanu. Um, anonymous, there is no name on it, uh, but uh, we know dating it from archaeological finds and thing that it is from the 8th century. So this so was discovered in Sri Lanka? It's a Sri yeah, these coin. coin. Yeah, these coins were basically discovered in Sri Lanka. Okay. Uh, for that particular coin, I don't know where, because these are the ones that come out of the archaeological so digs. If digging. it's found in an archaeological dig, it, mm. will be in, it should be in the museum. Uh, but then <laughs> people find these coins outside the digs, and then they come to collectors like us who sort of get them. Luckily, they come to collectors like us, because for a long time, these coins were getting melted. Mm -hmm. because it is illegal to sort of, if it is discovered, it should be handed over to the department, but the department doesn't sort of pay for it, so mm -hmm. people just melt it. So it took a lot of effort to actually get, stop these people melting it and okay. try to sell it to us so that at least we had a, a, a part of the archaeological find. And uh, so that's quite interesting. So I was quite interested in putting something on the web. Mm -hmm. And I put a history of Sri Lanka on the web, which was the first time we got a whole history called mm -hmm. Codrington's Short History of Ceylon, which was done actually with, by my son, okay. who was uh, four, Rajiv, who was 14 years old ah, <laughs> at <wow>. the time. <laughs> he got him to scan a whole book, right. OCR it, and put it online. This was back in 1998. Okay. Uh, when in the web was very, <laughs> very young, more than right? 20 years ago, <laughs> yes. when the web was very young. And uh, then he put the Mahavans also online. Wow which is also still online. So we can we uh, tell the viewers about the website? So, that so the Laktiva.org website has a lot of things about uh, uh, coins, about currency notes mm -hmm. uh, mainly because that's what I've been working on a lot. Mm -hmm. And then it has uh, books on Sri Lanka, um, um, old books, manuscripts, mm -hmm. the Mahavansa, some mm -hmm. history of Sri Lanka, a page on maps, old maps. My father was a uh, survey general in Sri Lanka. So he had a whole collection of maps that he had bought uh, when he was in World, uh, World War, just after World War II in, Europe, in England. Mm. And all these maps were on the street wow. from houses that had been bombed during the time. time okay. And he collected quite a collection. I have given some uh, scans of it to the National Archives. Mm -hmm. And uh, so with that collection, we uh, went on. So then I decided to put something on Sri Lanka and it's always good to put something which foreigners like to watch, look mm. at. So I thought of initially putting something on stamps, uh, but then I thought the stamps have only a 150 year history. Mm -hmm. And I opted to put a start on coins, coins. Had, particularly after I had found a gold coin in the US. And that kind of started uh, you. eBay started up somewhere around 1997. Yeah. And lots of Sri Lankan stuff came on eBay, really? including coins and whatever. And for the first few years, maybe up to about 2001, there were no other Sri Lankans buying on eBay. Mm. <laughs> so I was lucky. 
I could buy things because nobody else was That's interested in Sri Lanka oh, okay. or Ceylon stuff. Yeah. And for about four years, I had a field day buying a fairly large collection on eBay. Uh, now I would have to pay ten times that price if I wanted to buy the same. Something item like that. Because there are so many Sri Lanka Sri collectors Lankans. online, and the value has so probably gone up. As so well. the prices have gone up. Uh, for if you go back to 2,000 years ago, uh, uh, more than 2,000 years ago, this coin. Uh, which is uh, elephant and swastika coin. I have a web page which I saved there, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, that one. basically done. It is pro proposed that this was done as a commemorative coin for Mahinda's visit mm -hmm. because there are four emblems on it an elephant, mm -hmm. which is for the Buddha's birth, okay. uh, 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 bow tree, mm -hmm. which is for his enlightenment, mm -hmm. a, a real swastika for uh, the Dhamma that he preached. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, Chaitya, which is for Parinibbana. Oh, okay. So, Hetty Arachi back in the 60s said that this should be a commemorative coin for Mahinda's visit of mm -hmm. that era. So, it's mm -hmm. one of the uh, iconic coins of Sri Lanka, dates back to 200 BC. Okay. So, it's nice BC. to have oh. one in your hand. Yes. <laughs> there is a lot on display in the National Museum, Museum as well. Uh, as okay. well. So right. it's one of our iconic coins and mm -hmm. from there we have coins up to the gold coins mm -hmm. and uh, back in the uh, 19, I think it was in the 1990s we mm -hmm. published a souvenir sheet with ancient coins, coins of uh, Sri Lanka stamps okay. mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was lucky actually to get two of the coins that were used for that very souvenir sheet. Uh, the same coins. The same identical same coins. coins. And okay. ancient coins can be identified exactly because right. each is not identical to each other unlike modern coins. You can't tell two modern coins of the same type uh, okay. part, but ancient coins have so much of irregularities. Mm. I can find it was actually from the collector who originally right. uh, had those coins and gave it to the postal department for <laughs> Drawing, drawing these coins, so okay. I was very lucky. Right, so okay, all so these are put on a website called mm -hmm. coins.lakthiva.org, which has a thousand pages on Sri Lankan coins. Brilliant. Yeah. Doctor, also now the term uh, archaeology and physics and astronomy is something that's actually known to us, but something called astro archaeology is something that's actually strange and yeah. something now that we're in Sri very interestingly, astronomy and archaeology, even though they look far worlds apart has mm -hmm. something in common. Mm -hmm. In astronomy, when we look at the sky, mm -hmm. we are looking at things at a, at in the past of because course. the light takes you know Time mi millions of years to come to us or mm -hmm. thousands of years at least. And in archae uh, on archaeology, we also look at things from the past. There is another th common aspect is that in archaeology, you cannot experiment. Mm -hmm. You cannot touch uh, you can touch, but you can't actually experiment with the past. Soft. And in astronomy also, mm. we can only observe, we cannot experiment with the past. That's right. Now, there is a field which is very popular called archaeoastronomy. Mm -hmm. And that is where you use archaeology to do astronomical research. Mm -hmm. So, there is eclipses observed by the Chinese and previously with various parts of the world mm -hmm. and they recorded that they saw an eclipse on such and such a date and it is we can we know that those records. So astronomers, one of the things that astronomers need to derive mm -hmm. is the rotation of the earth. Okay. Now the rotation of the earth changes little tiny bits and sort of it's not random thing, it's a drift slight slowing down of the earth's rotation. And this, now if we have eclipses, we can mm -hmm. predict where the eclipse ha happened. Happen. And from the observation, we can tie in the observation to eclipses that are predicted where we really don't know at what longitude it happened. Mm -hmm. We know it happened, we know where, but depending on the rotation of the earth, mm -hmm. we wouldn't know exactly what place it would happen. Okay. So once you have an match up an e observed eclipse with the with a real thing, then you know exactly where it happened. Mm -hmm. And from that, one can derive mm -hmm. the rotation of the earth to the past. And this has been done all the way back to 700 BC. Mm -hmm. So now that we have calibrated the eclipses back to 700 BC, we can observe, uh, we can predict mm -hmm. where a total eclipse of the sun would have happened, mm -hmm. on what day it would mm -hmm. have happened. 
and that makes it interesting. Now we can t reverse the process. Okay. Now you have predicted epixes, you have where it was observed. And about 10 years ago, a friend of mine who is uh, also a coin collector, Brigadier Munasinghe, mm -hmm. suggested that I look at the Mahavansa mm -hmm. and see if I can identify any eclipses that were predicted there. Mm -hmm. So I looked at the record and I was quite s surprised actually mm -hmm. to find an eclipse uh, for, uh, uh, which happened on 481 BC, mm -hmm. uh, April 19th mm -hmm. at 8.30 in the morning. In the morning. And that was pr predicted and it also, it happened uh, across Nagadipa mm -hmm. in the north. the north and eclipses are very rare. In mm -hmm. any one place, it will happen once in 600 years. Mm -hmm. Once and in 600 years. So okay. that, it, that's also rare. I mean, Colombo had an eclipse back in 1955. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw it, but we won't see one another one for another couple of hundred years. Okay. So. Uh, uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, so, th so then I looked at the Mahavansa, mm -hmm. and in the Mahavansa, with respect to the second visit to the Buddha, mm -hmm. it gave a month, mm -hmm. and it also said that it happened at new moon, okay. and total eclipses of the sun mm -hmm. happened at new moon, and the month was exactly as given in the Mahavansa of this eclipse at on 481 BC. Mm -hmm. Same so day, same, same time. Same time as a month, the month is as predicted. Okay. Uh, the morning hours, it is as told in the Mahavansa. Oh, so it looked as if there was some match of the de what is described as the Buddha coming, mm -hmm. make creating darkness over the war and mm -hmm. the war ending mm -hmm. because of the fear of the people who were involved with that war. This is the war between Chuloj Chulo and, and the Mahandra. Okay. So there was a match there, and uh, and if you go further, you find that the deeper ones mm -hmm. actually describes to say that the Buddha mm -hmm. was seen as the stainless moon, mm. and that's what it is—a dark, completely black moon, which is completely not illuminated, is a stainless moon. Stainless. And so I think you couldn't get to a closer description of uh, uh, eclipse than that. Okay. And then to add to that, mm -hmm. uh, two and a half years uh, before that event, in seven, uh, 485 BC, mm -hmm. there was a total eclipse of the moon, which happened in the same month mm -hmm. as the Mahavansa describes the first visit, which was visible in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And one can derive all the statistical probabilities of having such a pair of eclipses over a period of uh, uh, 12, you know, uh, 600, 250 years I took. I mean, I said, I don't know when this happened. Yeah. I give a span of 250 years. And if you work the statistical probability, it comes out to be something like 1 in 360. So, in fact, to ra randomly to mm. have that combination of eclipses happening this as described in the Mahavansa wow, is about 1 in 360, like guessing your birthday without actually knowing, knowing it. it. Out of 360. <laughs> and that is a three sigma detection. So, I actually published this article uh, as a poster paper in a, a conference called Buddhist Archaeology back in 2012 and subsequently talked about it in many lectures. Okay. And I think it's a very interesting result of astroarchaeology, okay. which is where you use astronomy mm -hmm. to do archaeology because astronomical events can be dated exactly mm -hmm. and that in that way mm -hmm. you can actually get and date the events, the okay. archaeological events. All right. Okay, thank you, Doctor, so much. We had a long discussion today about archaeology and astrology, and also physics combined, and also Not about astrology. space. Nothing <laughs> to do with astrology. Astronomy, astronomy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so with that, we'd like to thank you once again, Doctor Kavan Ratnasinghe, uh, for coming in, uh, coming on board, and being with us because uh, you're a familiar face, as we always we've been saying uh, on the other yeah, program. I hope that starts again. Again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Doctor. So th thank you so much once again. And you can also visit Doctor's website, um, uh, lakdiva.org, and uh, find out more information about the discoveries and the kind of information that is available to you on the website. 
And uh, with that, with it's time to say uh, yes, goodbye. Yes, it's time for us to say um, goodbye on our Tuesday's edition on Rise and Shine. Um, yes, a lot of information, um, as we always say on Rise and Shine. Uh, mm -hmm. The last discussion was, of course, uh, very interesting uh, for all of our viewers. And uh, just like we also did enjoy, you know, talking about all this, you know, uh, science, physics, archaeology, and uh, so everything. many. Everything. Generalized. Everything as a whole. So, yes, till our team meets again tomorrow at the very same time. It's a bye-bye from both of us. Have a good day.